Hello, and welcome to Regrets I've Had a Few. I'm Paul Hunter, Artistic Director of Told by an Idiot, and this is a podcast where I talk to friends and colleagues delving into what made them the person they are today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Regrets I've Had a Few. Um, Today, I'm joined by a dear showbiz pal, star of stage and screen, Mr. Jason Barnett. Jason, welcome. How lovely to see you. Oh, hello. <laughs> it's lovely to see you as well. Thank you so much for dropping in. Um, I It, it feels very uh, r- recent that we last bumped into each other, of course, when you were in Bath filming your Agatha Raisin TV and we were reopening our homage to Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel. And um, we had a couple of very nice evenings and you very kindly came to see our show. I wanted to kick off by asking whether any of that kind of world of silent comedy was any part of your youth or your childhood? Did you like Stan and Ollie or did it pass you by? Oh my goodness, no, not not in the least did it pass me by. I loved it. I um, My introduction, I think my introduction to silent comedy was Harold Lloyd though. Ah. Um, because, and this will age me um, to anyone who knows, but he used to play on BBC Two, I think, after the children's programmes. You are absolutely right, Jason. I remember it well. Half an hour of Harold yeah. Lloyd sort of bits. Yeah. And um, they were, I mean, he was amazing. The stuff that he did. I mean, obviously, I think famously the hanging from that clock. Yeah. Um, which was just, oh, it was it was amazing. So he was my introduction. And then... Um, um, Chaplin followed that weirdly um and um yes and Lauren Hardy of course as well and all of those guys um the Keystone Cops and um yeah. oh who else well lots of yeah but yeah, yeah. Name, with, uh, with the house falling over him what was his name um, oh Buster Keaton Buster, Buster Keaton, Keaton yeah. yes yes you're right I mean it's interesting with the show we've made because of course it, it hopefully appeals to a very wide audience but people of our generation Jason and I, I've had a few conversations with people mm-hmm. who go, oh I remember watching them as a kid and yeah. encountering them then so it's nice to bring that back um another thing that we share uh Jason well amongst many things I mean work together but I realize we both share the same name as a sportsman I don't know if you know this. There is a Jason Barnett who played 270 times for Lincoln City. (laughs) (laughs) And and I share my name with the late, uh, sadly late, snooker player, Paul Hunter. So there's something. Now, I I know uh, we will touch on some footballing and acting a bit later on because you played a very famous sports figure, of course, on stage, which I enjoyed very much. But I will come back to that. But first of all, I'd like to take you uh, all the way back, if I may, Jason. What was your first kind of introduction to showbiz if you like or performing was it school play or youth theatre how did you get involved I got involved because I think um when (laughs) I was very little I think I wanted to be a famous explorer for a while (laughs) then I I wanted to be a famous doctor and I wanted to be a famous journalist and then I I realised that the sort of key thing that ran through that was famous um rather than <laughs> the actual career so that was <laughs> quite early on I realized that like I quite enjoyed the sort of limelight and I, I remember doing a school play like my very first school play was a show called Antics which I think ran in the West End um in the 60s maybe um at some point um and we did it as a school play um And I played one of the worker ants and I just, I so still remember just pulling on my brown socks, um, not brown socks, brown tights and putting on my little ant headwear and just being so excited to be involved in that because the previous year um, I'd seen Michelle Buckingham um, play Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and I was just like, right, I've I've got to have some of this. So that was my... (laughs) (laughs) I won't... Well, I I, um, I can picture you in your ant costume. Uh, it, it, I, that is an image that I'm uh, I'm finding very pleasing at this time on a on, on a Wednesday morning. Uh, I won't dwell on where Michelle Buckingham is now, following her Dorothy. But um, was there? A, I often ask this of, of guests. Was there at any point? I'm assuming. I, I I'm not assuming. I'm asking actually. Is there any kind of history of showbiz in your family? Anybody? No. In that world at all. So you were the first to to go into yeah, that world. Um, 
just came from yes nowhere really nobody was interested in that sort of thing um everyone's very um brilliantly hard working and <laughs> sensible sensible and um you know i i think as well um and my parents were like first generation um immigrants from jamaica sort of thing and um there wasn't a lot of room for frivolity basically which, which um um you know, however we put it, acting sort of is. Um, and so, yeah, that it just wasn't an, an option. I mean, like, obviously they had fun and we had lots of parties and there was music and there was frivolity in the household, but um, that wasn't an option for work. It's interesting. I was the same. I think I've said this on previous podcasts. My mom was a dinner lady and my dad was an electrician in Birmingham. So there was no context, the idea of being an actor. I think the assumption was I'd go and work in a car factory. So it's it's interesting that when you come very left field with something and how your parents try to, I suppose, understand that. Was that a bit of a journey for them when you were? I, I think it was. I, I, I remember sometimes my my. Um, my mum and dad had a little black and white telly in their in their bedroom, which I would sneak off to watch sometimes um, if, if I was allowed to. Um, and I would always watch the adverts and just copy them, um, just happily to myself sort of thing. And a few times my dad just caught me, just he would sit watching for five minutes as I was like doing all the different voices in the adverts. And, I, and every now and then I catch him chuckling away to himself. So I think that was his intro that I might be interested in that. And what about, um, was there any, um, as you went through school, you did your, made your debut in the Ants, uh, ants thing. Um, was there any particular teacher along the way that inspired you? Sometimes that's the case or not, not really? Yeah, I had really um, good teachers. I remember my head of year, Mr Thorne um, at Norbury Manor um, Boys School, um he was just like you know what you should go and join the Croydon Warehouse Youth Theatre um, ah. which is um which utterly changed my life actually doing that um yeah and he just you know at 12 he just said look I think you'd really enjoy it there's nothing more than that but um that sort of instruction and just telling me where to go and you know it'll cost you a quid every Saturday and like you'll need to be there and he just he knew what I had to do, I'd have been a bit flummoxed otherwise. I, I wouldn't have known what the next... Yeah, sometimes you need that introduction to something, don't you, or someone to give you a kind of lead on where... And, and a good usage, of which Croydon Warehouse is famously was a very good oh. usage. And I, I, does it still operate today? I don't know. Well, the building's not there anymore. Oh, no, of course, of a course, real, sadly. Yeah. It's a great little theatre, that... Um, so, so well, there's lots of theatres like that have just gone by the way, haven't they? Mm. But it's um, it's interesting as you kind of, I, I was at youth theatre, and I think, as well as having a great time and and enjoying, obviously the, it, it kind of taught me a bit of discipline as well about lots of things about being part of a group, like you say, turning up, and you yeah. know, and I think that was, I think I didn't realise that about acting that it required a certain amount of discipline. Yeah. <laughs> and negotiation as well I remember because I was madly into the kids from fame at the yes. time so all I sort of wanted to do was um um sing those songs and prance about and there were some other older kids at that youth theatre who were very much more serious and wanted to do little excerpts of Chekhov and stuff and I was just like what do you I want to sing high fidelity sort of thing and like having to put on a show which involved um both of those elements was also always a bit of a negotiation, but we get there. I think yeah. I think maybe this taps into my taste as a, someone who makes theatre now with my own company. I think the combination of high fidelity from kids from fame and Chekhov in the same show sits perfectly comfortably to me. But maybe, <laughs> oh, yeah. maybe that says more about our work than anything else, I suppose. Hey, maybe you saw some of those shows. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then did you go to study? acting or drama or did you just continue um, that route through youth theatre and then into work or no well I mean it's funny that this podcast is called regrets I've had a few yeah. because I didn't get to go and study um um not acting um I had to, again that was a negotiation my parents as I said before just didn't really have any sort of concept um of this as a career yeah um 
and um and a way of sort of making money and buying a house and all of those things which you, you should do or they felt you should do um so um when it came to university i had to negotiate with them and it was just like it was more right okay go and do a degree in english um and the negotiation was I did a degree in English and drama, but it wasn't um, it wasn't an acting degree really. It was very sort of um, academic, yeah. Um, because then you know you can teach and all that sort of stuff afterwards. So I didn't get to do um, that, and that's always been not always been. Uh, I think over the last ten years I've let it go, but I've always felt slightly oh dear, I didn't train, and all these lovely people around me are so brilliantly trained and like have have a philosophy and techniques and all the stuff that um I actually do have because I've picked them up along the way but you always feel as if it's sort of a bit second hand and grubby compared. well it's I don't, I don't know it's an interesting thing and it's interesting I, that you bring up that the, the title of the podcast and the kind of regrets of things I mean similarly I, I I did go to study acting but part of me as I've got older whether I will or not I don't know I kind of think oh I'd quite like to go to university or study something different now I'm older I think oh yes I because I, I didn't do that university thing so maybe it works a bit the other way but I can certainly relate to that feeling of sometimes thinking all oh, those people have trained in this or when I first came out of drama school and I was trying to make my way and I was very interested in you know all that visual explosion of work complicity and all the stuff that was mm. coming from Paris I always felt very conscious that in a room if people had studied at Lecoq I always thought, oh, my God, they must be brilliant. And then someone then said to me, look, Lecoq can't make you brilliant. It's, no. it's, <laughs> they might be good. They might not be good. But nowhere is going to make you a brilliant actor. So I think it's sometimes good to be able to go, do you know what? We, as you say, we pick up things along the way. We learn in different ways. And, um, yeah. and that's kind of what I like about acting is it can be quite a broad church in terms of where people have been and what their experiences are you know um I feel very lucky now actually um because exactly that i feel my 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 career has been such a broad church but i i my sort of english degree and uh, those leanings mean that i'm mad about script and i love to forensically like examine script but i'm also just you know i find physical work so joyous as well and i i feel oh actually the, being open to both of those ends of the spectrum i don't know if that's a, the right way of looking at it but being both open to both of those things um might not have been the case had i gone to somewhere a bit more prescriptive and um, yeah i think i think you could be right jace i think i think also if I think of you and the work I've seen you in and, and the work I've done with you, I think you've managed, I'm sure some of this is luck, as we all know along the way, luck plays mm -hmm. a big part, but you managed to combine that balance of different types of work in what you do. And, and we're all trying to do that, aren't we, as actors? You're trying to not get stuck in one thing or perceived as one thing. And, right, yeah. and when we get the chance to, um, to do different things, then we not only challenge ourselves but i think we challenge what other people think of us mm -hmm. so you so you came out of university and then what was it straight into theater were you because uh, i remember obviously bumping into you down at Bassey arts center and around there or, or what was your kind of starting points once you got going i starting but well i i um i took it a year to um earn some money i was a home help actually and uh -huh. i'm from fulham um for a year i used to cycle all around i'm actually from fulham helping lovely old people um, with their shopping and, and stuff. But during that time, um, we, I, a couple of friends from university were, we were like, oh, let's start a theatre company. So we, we started this company, two of us were actors and two of us were dancers. And so it was a dance theatre company. And again, at the same sort of time when DV8 and people yes, like yeah. that were um, very much out there and doing amazing work. And so um, we kind of wanted to, to do that. I remember once I went along to a DV8 audition, actually, uh, <laughs> because I had a couple of contact sessions with the dancers that I knew, and like I was just like, yeah, this is that's the stuff for me. It was the most embarrassing thing that's ever <laughs> happened to me ever. I started off in the front row of these dancers, there must have been probably 50 or 60 people in the room, and just couldn't keep up from the very beginning. And, <laughs> slowly went row by row back 
and sometimes in the back row and could just sneak out and like I think Lloyd Newsom must have been like who was who did he think he was that geezer wandering in there with his bloody tracksuit oh dear awful Um, but you but you do kind of I think those memories of those uh, awful auditions are are, are good to remind yourself of those sometimes, not too much, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I remember a, a, a one where I went for a, a musical at the National, and I'm certainly not a musical theatre at all, really, but they were doing a new version of The Frogs by Aristophanes as was a musical. So I went along and I sang this musical song and I got through to the second stage and I went back and you had to sing and dance. And I remember getting in the lift at the National to go off and the other guys in the lift started going, oh, so are you still in Five Guys Named Mo? And they went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what about you? Yeah, I'm just finishing company. I nearly got out at the, f- <laughs> at, at the, the floor where the canteen was and pretended I worked there. <laughs> so it's, it's good, but not too good to dwell on them, I suppose. Um, my, so, so I suppose my first a real memory of getting to know you was was obviously, as I said, down at Buffsey Art Centre, where lots of people, lots of us used to hang out and not just make work, but see extraordinary shows. And it was an amazing place, Buffsey Art Centre, I think, in the early 90s and throughout that decade with Tom at the helm. Um, was that somewhere that you kind of found yourself drawn to or, or was it just a one-off project or something? No, I, I, I think I, I sort of came of age in that sort of building really I think yeah likewise the, likewise yeah that sort of cemented um me as an actor and actually again I got to do such breadth of work it was amazing I think the first thing I did there was when the um James Mingy's Kitchen Award kicked off um I did a, a pinter there um that B. Jan Shibani directed um and that was that was the first thing that wow. I did there. um and then was, Bet- was Betris in that? Betris was in that. Yes, she yes. was. Betris Jones was in that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And that's the first time we worked to, to, together as well. And then, um, and then I got to do lovely work with Tom, um, Tom Morris, and Carl Heap, and yes, all, all that sort of gang, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the people that you. I don't think we worked together there. No, but... which I think I tried a few times, but you were very busy, Jason. Um, <laughs> um, but I do, I do remember, of course, not just yourself, but lots of pals like Steve Harper and Neil Ashdown and and Ed Wood, all the wonderful 1966 World Cup show, which I, oh, I so cool. I so enjoyed. Oh, okay. I, but I do remember at the time saying to Steve, I said he's going to do a show based on that. Yeah. And uh, he said, yeah. The, and I, I so enjoyed the kind of format and structure of it and the spirit yeah. of it was so brilliant. But did you have any r- reservations about playing such an iconic figure? I mean, I know he was dead at the time, Alf Ramsey, but he's a major figure in British sport. Or did that not worry you at all? No, I thought that was such an amazing um, opportunity, actually. And, um, and in a way, that sort of set me on on a... A funny old career as well because it was just so different and unexpected that you know this sort of portly black guy from South London is going to play um Alf Ramsey who I thought was brilliant casting and I, I enjoyed it so so very much and um and uh, you know that was that was a very good example of kind of diverse casting um um back in the day really and like obviously there were um, women playing some of the footballers and people of all sort of different ethnicities and ages and um, just making up this motley um, crew of a team um, and it, it it was brilliant but it was it was really lovely to just play something unexpected and I've always wanted to keep that element um, going I, I you know it, it was very hard back in those days to get telework and stuff where you weren't a thug or yeah, yeah. a criminal if you were, were black and not entirely but it, it was really no hard. no I'm sure and and I think Tom as you say it's some time ago and and I think that's what was so brilliant partly about the show was how the team was put together and who those who you all were and it kind of worked as a, also on one level as a brilliant metaphor for this team of those knobby styles and you know, and, and the beautiful skills of Bobby Charlton and, and it yeah. kind of it connected in that way, which I thought 
in a way was rather touching and as well. It was glorious because Carl was a real fan of westerns as well, so he wanted to base it all on the sort of magnificent yeah. Set. Yeah, and Alf Ramsey scoping the plains of England to find this. Crew yeah, no, that, that worked was... brilliantly. Um, <laughs> now I, I, can't, I, I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit because when yeah. you mention iconic figures like Alf Ramsey, another I realise only through chatting to people who have children of a certain age, another iconic figure is Waffle the Wonder Dog. Um, ah. So I have to admit, Jen, our producer, who has a dog called Frank, is often stopped and uh, asked about Waffle because of the type of dog that she has. But th this is something presumably you're very proud of, Waffle the Wonder Dog. It sounds amazing. <laughs> Waffle the Wonder Dog. The talking <laughs> dog who, who turns up at my school. Um, I'm not very... I play the head teacher in this show. And uh. um, I'm not very impressed that all of the kids <laughs> want this canine to start um <laughs> attending school but i get talked into it he's my nemesis but um <laughs> it's ridiculous it's like it's such a silly show but it's amazing and 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 children it's one of those things yes you yeah. see people sort of little five-year-olds staring at you open-mouthed in sainsbury's and they're like <laughs> yeah, mr nolan and then, oh it's lovely it's so nice and it's so nice to do the voice and like see them like scuttle behind their mum or behind the shopping trolley or whatever. It's great. It's such a lovely show and 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 brilliantly um, physical as well as, uh, you know, a, a lot of children's shows can be, but um, they like they like to make sure that there's that madcap sort of physical element to it. Um, and Sounds like, great. It's great. Sometimes you have stuntmen and stuff and like it's always very funny when it, when the stuntman turns up because he's usually like this brilliantly fit um, <laughs> guy who and then they start putting padding on him and then it, it's just like and I'll be there watching and they'll be like no more padding yeah, yeah uh, no more padding <laughs> and, uh, more no more more padding and I'm like I'm here I'm here <laughs> I really don't think he needs that much padding. I also but, think. I don't know about you, but I sometimes think the world of TV and film in itself can be quite brutal like that because yeah. they're trying to make a job happen. They're not yeah. always conscious of how something no. comes across. I've had similar situations. I think, hmm, not sure yeah. about how that just described me and my character yeah. there, but there, there you go. Um, but, I mean, you've managed, as I said, to make that crossover, which not everybody does. It's hard to make that crossover into TV and film. and and um, was that a conscious attempt? Did you have to? Did you regret turning down some theatre to focus on it? Or was there anything you missed out on? Or no, weirdly, um, I don't. I don't feel that um, particularly. I, it's sort of been what's come along at whatever time. I, I, I did three years in the bill um, at one point, just after. I think it was just after we opened Warhol. So I, yeah. I didn't stay with the show. I went. Um, straight into the building. I remember going to Wendy Spon um, at the time and saying to her, oh, look, Wendy, um, you know, they've offered me this regular in, in the build, but, you know, I want to come back here. Am I am I sort of treading on my chances if I if I do that? And she was like, well, you do know I used to cast the bill. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, right, okay. And, and um, oh gosh, who was in charge at the time? Um, who was the um, artistic director at the National? At, the uh, um, at that point, Nicholas Heitner, maybe? Nicholas, and she was like, and, the, yeah. and Nicholas has never watched an episode of The Bill. <laughs> 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 it's really not going to put him off. <laughs> That's a, that is a, that is a, that is a brilliant answer. That is a very, <laughs> very... It wasn't, it didn't feel like, you know, because of supportive conversations like that, it sort of just felt, you know, crack on do what comes up, enjoy it again. And, and that was a very different part. It, it was, you know, a forensic scientist who was the sharpest person in the room. And, uh, and so it was lovely to go to a show like The Bill and, and not be a long running criminal or just, or a bumbling copper. I've played lots of bumbling coppers, but um, at that point, you know, he was, he was absolutely sharp, almost sort of genius level. And that was, you know, that was different and, Great fun. It's interesting as well, isn't it, as you say, and I think I completely understand the way you talk about uh, uh, in your career challenging perceptions, which, you know, 
is crucial and maybe do you feel it's changing slowly for, for, for the way the business is in terms of how people are cast or or is there still a long yeah. way to go I'm, I'm, you know I mean, both of those yeah. things really is changing, um, but there is still an awful long way to go. I was talking to my agent about this yesterday, actually, um, and she was saying, you know, her, the breakdowns she re receives are are massively different than they were even five That's years good. ago. But and that is good. But I was saying that yes, but it, you know, it's still in the realms of the support yeah. and the best yeah. friend. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. which you know those steps have to happen but it's it tends not to be the lead it tends not to yes. be um that you know the star the the vehicle yeah. won't be a person of color that that much yeah. yet so it's changing but it, 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 you know it's interesting it's never fun. you know i when we cast stan laurel in our our show the charlie chaplin stan laurel show and i i I saw uh, Jerome Marsh read three times for the part because it's it's a very difficult part. You're asking a young young actor to take on something very iconic again in that role, and uh, so I needed to be very sure. And I saw him in a workshop with a group of actors. I I saw him again where I recalled him and I worked him with Steve Harper came in and I worked them together just so I could see him playing. Then I brought him in against the person who was going to play Charlie. And very early on, Jerome said to me, "Can I say one thing?" He said, "I just want to thank you." getting yeah. me in for the role and i went you're very welcome that's fine so because I, I thought my agent had made a mistake i would never think i would be able to come in for something like this or a part like this um and i think you kind of forget or one can easily forget that even getting in the room is a big deal sometimes to even get seen for that a particular part so luckily he turned out to be brilliant so i could cast him up so <laughs> it worked out all right but <laughs> But you're right, there's still much more to do. In terms of something which I thought, I don't know what, uh, we both were involved. I think you did a lot more than me. I, I only did one episode. The extraordinary success that was Bridgerton. And yeah. Um, I, yeah. it was funny because I remember doing my bit and spending some time talking to uh, Adua the, the, the day we were filming. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a scene with her, but you know, knowing her from the lyric and all that kind of stuff. But that felt like they'd made a real conscious attempt to look at the diversity of casting in that a particular show um and I, I don't know i don't know what you thought but it, it felt like that when i was on set a bit more i don't know yeah that was really that was really exciting it was a shonda rhyme show so she that's what she does yeah. she she writes something and then she says right uh, she writes it so that anyone can play anything yeah with it um and then she casts the person that she thinks is is right and obviously she's a black producer and so i think that feeds into her work she just wants everyone to be available yeah for... and how brilliant to see golda play the queen oh what a brilliant goodness. queen she was yeah. <laughs> and brilliant that actually uh, that ties in historically as well doesn't it um because um she was black potentially um it's queen caroline isn't it um and um or certainly had black antecedents sort of thing so it yeah. and i think that's maybe where the germ of the whole idea yeah sort of sort of came from but i have to admit jason i don't know about you when i got this part i thought okay it sounds interesting i knew nothing about bridgerton mm. and then over that christmas i got so many texts of people saying oh my god you're in bridgerton and it became this extraordinary successful show didn't it? i didn't know anything about it. i i couldn't believe it i it was so it was so good i've never had more goodie bags in my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I really developed a relationship with my post um, person and the delivery. <laughs> they were coming thick and fast, sometimes two or three a day from um, yeah. Netflix are just brilliant uh, because I think um, I don't actually do that much, but I'm in every episode, like, you know, yeah. probably brushing um, the beautiful reggae Jean's um, coat a lot and um, doffing my cap to him and stuff. But because I'm, in every episode, I sort of count as the ensemble, and so I do, I read so many gifts. It was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I haven't stopped drinking champagne off the back of that since. It's, it's uh, well, that's, yeah, that was lovely. That's very well deserved. And the <laughs> thing that I the thing that I also uh, uh, enjoyed about our time when we've done shows or 
bits of stuff together. One of my favourite memories is sharing a dressing room with you at the Young Vic during uh, Galileo, and we didn't. And in our dressing room, we introduced Champagne Saturdays, yeah. the, the last show of the week, and that's that feeling of coming in and sharing that with you at the end of a long day's week was something that I and all of us in that room, I have very fond memories of. Oh, great. Um, Jason, I've got one final thing to ask you, if that's all right. Yeah, cool. I'm going to say some random questions. <laughs> you, respo you respond immediately with the, your, your first choice as, a, as an answer, if that's all right. Well, Pinot, Grigio, Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc? Oh, Pinot Grigio, absolutely. Sauvignon Blanc is disgusting. Um, <laughs> porridge or Only Fools and Horses? Oh, porridge, porridge. Has to be porridge. I was in porridge. Uh, uh, Master Chef or Great British Bake Off? Oh, Master Chef by a country mile. <laughs> Uh, UK <laughs> and Australia. Perfect. Eddie Murphy or Richard Pryor? Oh, Rich Pryor. Sweet. Steve, Steve Martin or Billy Connolly? Connolly. Oh, oh, Billy. Billy. <laughs> Calves liver or steak tartare? Oh, tartare, I think. Ah. Oh. Gardening or walking? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard choice <laughs> gardening 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 the shining or alien oh flipping egg um alien i think uh, you're finding scary <laughs> tightrope or the trapeze oh oh in terms of being able to do either in your dreams you can do either you like tightrope or trapeze. i would love to be able to do the trapeze but i think i'm probably Oh, they're both. Eh? No, no, that's yeah. you can have the trapeze. trapeze. And finally, Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton? Buster Keaton. Jason, it's been so lovely chatting to you. Oh, thank and you. And let's let's uh, let's make it not too long before we bump into each other somewhere and have a glass somewhere in oh, town. I'm yeah. sure we will. Let's do a champagne Saturday, please. Exactly. All the best, Jason. Take care, mate. Thank you. Bye bye. Lots of love. Cheers. Bye bye. Dear listeners. If you've enjoyed this idiot podcast, please keep it to yourself. <laughs>